Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC Civil Services examination point of view. Now today we are taking important news from New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 11th February 2023 and the news to be discussed has been displayed on your screen. Now let's start our discussion with this lead article appearing on page number 6 and this article is in reference to the recently concluded All India Conference of Director Generals and Inspector Generals of Police and this conference was also attended by India's Prime Minister. Now in this article, the author who is also a former Director of Intelligence Bureau has highlighted certain concerns with respect to the security challenges which poses before the security agencies and the security agencies includes both police and also other agencies. So here the author suggests that with respect to the advancing technologies in the present circumstances, the police is unable to cope up with the antagonist. Now the term antagonist refers to criminals or other non-state actors who pose as threat to India's national security. And one of the major concerns highlighted by the author is that in this conference, particularly, there was a lack of in-depth discussion on security-related issues and futuristic themes in policing. Now, the conference did cover various aspects of policing such as national security, including counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency and cyber-security. Yet, the author highlights that there was lack of in-depth discussion on these important issues. So, according to the author, these areas which are the key theme for the upcoming 21st century or for upcoming times needs to be thoroughly discussed and researched because policing will depend on the greater use of these technologies such as increasing proliferation of cyber warfare. So, there should be more in-depth discussion and also change in policing patterns or the pattern of security agencies dealing with cyber warfare. Further, he talks about threat from use of artificial intelligence, data war which is currently taking place, the greater use of dark web, the aspects of cryptocurrency, also issues pertaining to maritime security, threats from drones and other similar devices, problems stemming from unchecked social media, left-wing extremism, counter-terrorism, drug trafficking, border issues and also other emerging threats in the 21st century, keeping in mind the advancement of technology. So basically what the author suggests is that the antagonist or the criminals are using advanced technologies for modern warfare which impacts India's internal and external security and also poses a security threat or a security challenge. So in order to address these issues with respect to advancing technology which are used by the antagonist, the security apparatus should also retaliate in the same manner and for this purpose, first of all there is a need for more discussion and there is also need for skill development of the security personnel. So in this regard, let us understand some of the concerns which has been highlighted by the author with respect to the growing security challenges, particularly with respect to advancement in science and technology. Now this topic of national security or growing threats of internal and external security challenges becomes part of GS Paper 3, particularly with respect to role of external state and non-state actors in creating challenges to internal security. Challenges to internal security through communication networks, role of media and social networking sites in internal security challenges, basics of cyber security, money laundering and its prevention, and also security challenges and their management in border areas, along with linkages of organized crime with terrorism. So internal security becomes one of the major chunk of part of GS Paper 3. And hence, you should not ignore this topic as this topic is very important and every year questions have been asked from this particular section which can be easily addressed. Now, this particular conference was also attended by India's Prime Minister and here he suggested various aspects such as he suggested making police forces more sensitive and training them in emerging technologies. He suggested or emphasized on importance of national data governance framework basically for smoothening of data exchange across government agencies. He emphasized on enhanced cooperation between state police and central agencies to tackle both external and internal security threats. And also the Prime Minister recommended to repeal obsolete criminal laws and also suggested for prison reforms. So keeping all these aspects in mind, first of all, let us understand the components of national security. It comprises of both external security and internal security challenges. 
Now, external security challenges encompasses or it is influenced by international situations or international order, threats from immediate or extended neighbors or also threat from major superpowers of the world and also threats from non-state actors having vested interest or who want to proliferate any of their ideology. So in a nutshell, these can be said to be challenges with respect to external security for India. Now, when we talk about internal security, the challenge is, is mostly from within the country and it encompasses aspects of day-to-day -day national life, including the law and order situation, economic offenses, issues pertaining to left-wing extremism and also governance issues or issues pertaining to the quality of governance. So these are some of the aspects of internal security challenges. And in the modern times, both external security threat and internal security threat cannot be tackled by military power alone or by using greater force. So here the author has also suggested that by using mere greater force or military power or heavy power or heavy handed approach is not the solution. And there has to be change in perception and also skills of the security personnel. Now this topic has also been covered in the mains compass of 2022 and will also be covered later when mains compass for 2023 will be published. So the mains compass has highlighted that a more realistic approach to tackle national security issues not only to have a military power that is not only through military power alone but through economic strength, through internal cohesion between center and states and ensuring skill development for the personals to tackle such technological advancements which is used by the antagonist or by the criminals. So all three when combined together provides a more realistic approach to tackle national security challenges which includes both external security challenges and also internal security challenges. And these three aspects are the economic strength of the country, internal cohesion between central and state agencies and also technological advancement of the security apparatus. Now, after understanding these aspects, let us go through the issues which has been highlighted by the author with respect to tackling security challenges in India. And this includes tackling both internal and external security challenge. So let's go through these points which has been highlighted in this article. So the first point which we have already discussed is regarding lack of in-depth discussion during the conference on security related issues and also futuristic themes in policing. Now the second point highlighted here is decision making in 21st century needs fundamental shift to tackle growing internal and external security threats. And this fundamental shift is with respect to the emerging challenges with respect to advancement in technology used by various criminals including cyber warfare including artificial intelligence or other innovative techniques used by the criminals. So the security apparatus needs proper training to address these advanced challenges and also there is a need for shift in decision making process. So here the author says that emerging challenges would require greater innovativeness and agility as well as demonstration of new cognitive skills to meet challenges posed by swift technological change and rise of data war fighting. And to address these challenges, he says that the decision making in these circumstances needs to undergo fundamental changes entailing more purposive discussion at higher levels. So the author has suggested for a top-down approach where the top acclients of the security apparatus including the officers needs to discuss this fundamental change which is to be implemented to tackle challenges pertaining to advancement in technology. And here the author suggests that there is a need for new innovative skills in technology and also crowd management. So apart from imparting technological skills, the police force and other security agencies should also be trained to tackle crowd management as here also the author says that only by use of force crowd management cannot be and new innovative skills needs to be implemented here also for crowd management. So here the author says that most energy of the security apparatus has been concentrated to tackle threats emanating from terrorism and this has put the law and order management on back burner or has been sidelines. So here the author says that more effort has been concentrated to tackle challenges pertaining to terrorism and because of this the issues pertaining to law and order have been sidelines. So here the author says that managing today's angry and often unruly mobs requires a fresh set of skills and inherent abilities apart from mere technology and cannot be solved with a heavy handed approach. 
as heavy handed approach create another set of problems rather than solving them by use of excessive force disproportionately against the unruly mob so the security apparatus needs better training for crowd management or to tackle crowd management now other challenges in this article highlights there is a need for adequate training for police forces for advances in weaponry and technology further the author suggests that greater attention is required in selection and also training of security agencies keeping technological advancement in mind as the police should not only mirror the present society but should also be ready for future challenges so here the author says that the police forces must mirror the kind of society we live in today and must be capable of dealing with today's modern antagonist as they employ a variety of tactics and skills use common imagery to keep track of developing situations including use of social media and for this purpose there is a need for a different mindset than just acquiring skills that is technical skills to match the criminals so here the author says that a different mindset altogether is needed to tackle such criminals who are adept in using advanced technology the next point highlighted here is that the security apparatus needs to properly use open source intelligence to tackle unruly protester now open source intelligence is basically derived from data and information which is available to the general public from public domain so it can be available through social media it can be available through various websites through tv broadcast etc so the police should properly use open source intelligence to tackle unruly protesters and lastly the author mentions another very important point which is to streamline multiple security agencies having overlapping functions to avoid inter agency squabble or inter agency fight so here the author says that presence of multiple security agencies on the same crime or on the same issue including intelligence and investigative agencies seldom act with a common purpose and their techniques and methods also differ from one another and this difference in techniques and methods in solving crime often leads to contradictions among themselves so in order to avoid these confrontation or contradiction there is a need to streamline multiple security agencies currently operating in india such as ib raw ed etc so here the author says that proliferation of agencies was intended to create specialized agencies for special requirements and far from easing the burden of individual agencies they often hinder proper analysis and investigation so there is a need to streamline the function and purpose of these multiple agencies and the government must ensure that they work in collaboration and not create conflict among themselves so these are some of the issues which has been highlighted in this particular article to tackle security challenges in india now as suggested earlier even the prime minister of india has made certain suggestion at the conference so he said that there is a need to make police forces more sensitive and train them in emerging technologies so even the prime minister highlighted the importance of training the personals in emerging technologies further the prime minister emphasized on importance of national data governance framework for smoothing of data exchange across agencies further the prime minister also suggested that while there is a need to leverage technological advancement or technological solutions like biometrics artificial intelligence etc there is also a need to further strengthen traditional policing mechanism like foot patrols as it will help to improve immediate police response to any particular crime further the prime minister also emphasized on enhanced cooperation between state police and central agencies to leverage capabilities and share best practices now internal cohesion between central and state agencies has also been highlighted as a more realistic and comprehensive approach to tackle national security issues further the prime minister also suggested to replicate the model of dgps and igps conference at the state and district level in order to discuss emerging challenges and evolving best practices among their teams as this will further create awareness among the district officials about the growing security challenges particularly with respect to advancement in technology further the prime minister also recommended repealing obsolete criminal laws and also suggested prison reforms to improve jail management and he also discussed strengthening of border as well as coastal security by organizing frequent visits of officials so these are some of the important suggestions made by the prime minister at the 57th all india conference of director generals inspector generals of police now as already discussed this topic becomes important from the perspective of gs paper 3 regarding internal and external security and look at the questions asked by upsc in gs paper 3 in 2021 and 2022 
So the question asked in 2022 was, what are the different elements of cybersecurity? Keeping in view the challenges in cybersecurity, examine the extent to which India has successfully developed a comprehensive national cybersecurity strategy. The question carried 15 marks. Now these two questions were asked in 2021. So the question was, keeping in view India's internal security, analyze the impact of cross-border cyber attacks. Also discuss defensive measures against these sophisticated attacks. Question carried 10 marks. And the 15 marks question was, analyze the multi-dimensional challenges posed by external state and non-state actors to the internal security of India. Also discuss the measures required to be taken to combat these threats. So number of questions has been asked on this aspect of internal and external security. Hence this topic becomes very important from the perspective of GS paper 3. Now this topic of cyber security and other aspects pertaining to internal security has been discussed in detail in the mains compass of 2022. As you can see the topics discussed here was cyber security threat, types of cyber security threats, impact of cyber attacks, challenges in India cyber security and also national cyber security policy based on which the question was asked. And based on our discussion so far, this becomes your main question for practice. The question is, amidst increasing proliferation and use of advanced technology, discuss the challenges in tackling internal and external security threats by security agencies. And this question carries 10 marks. So this topic becomes very important from the perspective of mains examination under GS paper 3. With this, let's take up the next topic for discussion. Now let's take these two news appearing on page number 10 and this news is with respect to appointment of Justice Gauri as additional judge of Madras High Court as her appointment was also challenged in the Supreme Court. Now appointment of High Court and Supreme Court judges are done by the President of India as judges of High Court are appointed under Article 217 that is 217 of the Indian Constitution and the judges of Supreme Court are appointed under Article 124 of the Indian Constitution. But this appointment is based on the recommendation of the Collegium and the recommendation of the Collegium is mandatory. So this news on page number 10 highlights that suitability of a candidate cleared by Collegium cannot be subject of judicial review. Whereas the adjacent news highlights about the statement of India's law minister where he said that no timeline has been prescribed for transfer of judges under the Memorandum of Procedure. So first of all, coming to the appointment of Justice Victoria Gauri, the scope of judicial review with respect to the petition challenging her appointment was that the legal issue raised in the writ petition relates to the scope and ambit of judicial review in matter of appointment of judges to the High Courts under Article 217 of the Constitution of India. And here the Supreme Court has held that judicial review under Article 32 of the Indian Constitution lies on the aspects of eligibility of the judge which is prescribed under article 217 clause 2 but not on suitability so if a petition is challenged based on suitability or which questions the suitability of the candidate who is appointed as judge of a high court then such petition shall not be judicially reviewed as only the aspect of eligibility of a candidate can be judicially reviewed now, suitability of a candidate can be determined based on his or her worth. So, the Supreme Court has held that their suitability cannot be judicially reviewed, but their lack of eligibility can be reviewed, which has been provided under Article 217 Clause 2 for the judges of High Court and under Article 124 for the judges of Supreme Court. Further, the Supreme Court also held that appointment can also be challenged with respect to lack of consultation, that is lack of consultation by the Collegium as the executive function of the president to appoint judges of High Court and Supreme Court is basically performed based on Collegium's recommendation. Now the Collegium to appoint judge of High Court comprises of three senior most judge of Supreme Court including the Chief Justice of India and two senior most judge of the High Court concerned including the Chief Justice of the State High Court. And the second thing which you need to know is about Constitution 99th Amendment which has been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of India along with the NJAC Act. Now this is important information because the Constitution 99th Amendment added certain provisions with respect to the NJAC under Article 124 and also Article 217 along with Article 222 of the Indian Constitution with respect to the appointment of judges to High Court and Supreme Court. 
Now, with respect to appointment of judges of High Court and Supreme Court, after Constitution 99th Amendment, the aspect of NJAC or National Judicial Appointment Commission was added in various provisions of the Indian Constitution. So, Article 124 says that every judge of a Supreme Court shall be appointed by the President by warrant under his hand and seal on the recommendation of National Judicial Appointment Commission. But after the Supreme Court declared the NJAC Act and Constitution 99th Amendment as unconstitutional, the old recommendations of the Collegium's recommendation is mandatory as of now. Similarly, Article 217 of the Indian Constitution mentions that every judge of a High Court shall be appointed by the President by warrant under his hand and seal based on the recommendation of NJAC as referred in Article 124A. Similarly, with respect to transfer of a judge from one High Court to another, it says that President may, on the recommendation of NJAC, referred to in 124A, transfer a judge from one High Court to another High Court. Similarly, even for appointment of additional and acting judges, it highlights about President's consultation with the NJAC. But after Supreme Court judgment, recommendations of NJAC is not taken because NJAC Act, along with Constitution 99th Amendment Act, has been declared as unconstitutional. And if you look at Article 124 prior to Constitution 99th Amendment, then Article 124 Clause 2 says that every judge of a Supreme Court shall be appointed by the President by warrant under his hand and seal after consultation with such judges of the Supreme Court and of the High Courts in states as President may deem necessary and shall hold office until the age of 65 years. And Article 124 Clause 3 further mentions about the aspect of eligibility of a candidate suitable for judge of a Supreme Court. So it says that a person shall not be qualified for appointment as judge of the Supreme Court unless he is a citizen of India and has been for at least five years a judge of a high court or two or more such courts in succession, has been for at least 10 years an advocate of a high court or of two or more such courts in succession, or is in the opinion of the president a distinguished jurist. So this becomes the eligibility criteria for a person to be appointed as judge of a Supreme Court. So let's go through the provision prior to the Constitution 99th Amendment to better understand the executive function of the President to appoint judges of High Court and also that of Supreme Court based on the Collegium's recommendation. Now we all know that Collegium's recommendation was provided through the second and third judges case. So here Article 217 mentions about appointment and conditions of office of judge of a High Court. It says that every judge of a high court shall be appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal and after consultation with the chief justice of India, the governor of the state and in the case of appointment of judge other than the chief justice, the chief justice of the high court shall hold office in case of an additional or acting judge as provided under article 224 that is here and in any other case until he attains the age of 62 years. And regarding the eligibility conditions, Article 217 Clause 2 states that a person shall not be qualified for appointment as judge of a high court unless he is a citizen of India and has for at least 10 years held a judicial office in the territory of India or has for at least 10 years been an advocate of a high court or of two or more such courts in succession. So this is the eligibility criteria which has been provided under Article 217 Clause 2 based on which judicial review is allowed. So judicial review is allowed with respect to eligibility of a candidate and not with respect to suitability of a candidate. That is whether a candidate is suitable for the job as it becomes a matter of subjective opinion. Now coming to article 224 which talks about appointment of additional and acting judges. So it says that if by reason of any temporary increase in the business of a high court or by reason of arrears of work therein. It appears to the president that number of judges of that court should be for that time being increased then the president may appoint duly qualified persons to be additional judges of the high court for such period not exceeding two years as he may specify and no person appointed as additional or acting judge of a high court shall hold office after attaining the age of 62 years so these are the provisions with respect to appointment of judges of high court under article 217 and also article 224 so it is based on these provisions, the Supreme Court has highlighted that judicial review with respect to appointment of a person as judge of High Court or Supreme Court can only be done on grounds of lack of eligibility or lack of consultation, but not on the aspects of suitability of the candidate. So after understanding these highlights, let's go through the opinion of the Supreme Court with respect to this particular judgment. So the Supreme Court dismissed the petition challenging the appointment of Justice Victoria Gauri as judge of Madras High Court and the court held that suitability cannot be subject matter of judicial review and collegium recommendation cannot be examined on the judicial side. 
Now the court also referred article 217 clause 1 and 217 clause 2. So the court prescribed the constitutional requirement of consultation. It says that fitness of a person to be appointed as judge of a high court is evaluated in the consultation process. An evaluation of the worth and merit of a person is a matter entirely different from eligibility of the candidate for elevation. So evaluation of the person that is worth of a person or merit of the person can be based can be subject to opinion or it can differ based on different persons. But eligibility criteria has been provided objectively under Article 217 Clause 2. So the court said that Article 217 Clause 2 prescribes the constitutional requirement of consultation, prescribes the procedure to be followed, which procedure is designed to test the fitness of a person so to be appointed, their character, integrity, competence and knowledge and the likes. So the court held that judicial review is restricted based on provisions of Article 217 Clause 2. And the court said that consultative process is to limit the judicial review, restricting it to specific area, which is eligibility and not suitability of the candidate. So Article 217 Clause 2 provides for the eligibility criteria based on which judicial review is possible or is allowed. Now on this very issue, the court held that they cannot issue the writ of mandamus or certiorari Cautioning the recommendations of the Collegium. So the Supreme Court said that it cannot issue a writ of certiorari, quashing the recommendation or mandamus, calling upon the Collegium of the Supreme Court to reconsider its decision, as it would amount to evaluating and substituting the decision of Collegium. So basically, they cannot substitute the decision of the Collegium with individual or personal opinion on the suitability and merits of the person. So again, the court emphasized that the aspect of suitability or personal opinion is not subject to judicial review with respect to appointment of a person as High Court Judge or Supreme Court Judge. Now another important aspect highlighted by Supreme Court is that judicial review does not lie on the content of consultation. And this important observation was based on the earlier nine judge bench of Supreme Court that is the second and third judges case namely the Supreme Court Advocates on Record Association and others versus Union of India. So the court observed that judicial review lies when there is lack of eligibility or lack of effective consultation and judicial review does not lie on content of consultation. So this becomes another important review of Supreme Court. Further on judges recent controversies about certain statements made by her, the court held that a judge's pledge and her duty transcends religious, linguistic, regional or sectional diversities and as additional judge. She is under daily scrutiny from lawyers, litigants and also public and courts are an open court and the decision given by the judge has to be based on the reasons. So it highlights that the judges spoke by giving reasons in writing for their decisions. And here the court also highlighted about the obligation which is cast on a citizen including the judge of a high court and supreme court with respect to article 51a which is a part of fundamental duty. So the court held that Article 51A of the Indian Constitution casts an obligation on every citizen and more so on every judge to promote harmony, spirit of common brotherhood and among all transcending religious, linguistic, regional or sectional diversities. So effectively the court held that it is the legal and constitutional duty of the judge to provide reasoned order as judges pledge and duty transcends religious, linguistic, regional or sectional diversities. Another important aspect highlighted by the Supreme Court was that the primacy of judiciary in matters of appointments and its determinative nature in transfers introduces the judicial element in the process and is itself a sufficient justification for the absence of need of further judicial review of those decisions. As the court said that the entire process itself is judicial process and this judicial process of collegium basically acts as a check against possible executive excess or executive arbitrariness. So overall the court said that the primacy of judiciary given in matters of appointment that is primacy of recommendation of the collegium is determinative in nature and its suggestions are judicial element in the process of transfers or appointments. So these are some of the important highlights of the Supreme Court judgment where it held that judicial review under Article 32 can be taken up on lack of eligibility under Article 217 Clause 2 or under Article 124 with respect to judges of High Court and Supreme Court respectively and also with respect to the aspect of lack of consultation but not on grounds of suitability of a candidate or on grounds of content of consultation. 
Now let's take up the next news where the law minister has highlighted that no timeline has been prescribed in the memorandum of understanding for transfer of judges. So here let's go through the constitutional provision with respect to transfer of judges of high court and also about the MOP or memorandum of procedure. Now both these news appears on page number 8 and not on page number 10. Please note this fact. So now let's go through article 222 and also about the MOP. Now these constitutional provisions along with MOP or memorandum of procedure can be asked in your examination. So here we need to understand about the process also that is what has been provided under the memorandum of procedure. So article 222 of the Indian constitution mentions about transfer of a judge from one high court to another. So it says that a president may after consultation with the chief justice of India transfer a judge from one high court to any other high court. It further says that when a judge has been or is transferred to another high court judge, then such judge shall be entitled to receive in addition to his salary such compensatory allowance as may be determined by parliament by law and until so determined such compensatory allowance as the president may by order fix. Now coming to the MOP. Now MOP basically lists down the process which is followed with respect to appointment or transfer of judges. Now memorandum of procedure has been provided with respect to all the provisions in the Indian constitutions with respect to either appointment of judge or transfer of judge of high court or supreme court respectively. So here let's go through the MOP with respect to article 222 of the Indian constitution which provides for transfer of one high court judge from another. So it highlights that article 222 of the Indian constitution makes provision for transfer of a judge including that of Chief Justice of High Court. So it provides for transfer of Judge of High Court along with Chief Justice of High Court from one High Court to other High Court. And the process for such a transfer is initiated by the Chief Justice of India as his opinion that is the opinion of the CJI is determinative. Because even under Article 222 it says that President after consultation with the Chief Justice of India may transfer a judge from one High Court to another. So the consultation of Chief Justice of India is very important and determinative. It further says that consent of a judge for his first or subsequent transfer would not be needed and all transfers are to be made in public interest that is to promote better administration of justice throughout the country. Now the MOP further says that the Chief Justice of India while transferring a judge other than the Chief Justice of the High Court shall take opinion of the Chief Justice of a High Court from where the person is to be transferred and also the Chief Justice of the High Court to where the person is transferred. So suppose if the judge of Madras High Court is to be transferred to Bombay High Court, then the Chief Justice of India will take opinion of Chief Justice of both High Courts that is Bombay High Court and also that of Madras High Court. Further the CGI also takes into account the views of another judge of the Supreme Court. So it says that Chief Justice of India should also take into account the views of one or more Supreme Court judges. So one Supreme Court judge or more Supreme Court judges who are in a position to offer their views which would assist in the process of deciding whether or not a proposed transfer should take place. So the opinion of other judges of Supreme Court shall also be taken by the Chief Justice. Now in the case of transfer of Chief Justice of a High Court, in such case, the CGI shall take only the views of one or more knowledgeable Supreme Court judges and not any other High Court judge. So this becomes an important factor from your prelims point of view that in case of transfer of Chief Justice of a High Court, then in such situation the Chief Justice of India shall only take view of one or more knowledgeable Supreme Court judges and not that of other High Court judges or the Chief Justices of other High Courts. Now these opinion of the judges shall be expressed in writing. So it says that views on the proposed transfer of a judge or a chief justice of a high court should be expressed in writing and should be considered by the chief justice of India and the four senior most judges of the supreme court. So this composition of judges for recommendations differs from appointment to transfer. So if we look at the memorandum of procedure for appointment of Chief Justice of High Court under Article 217, then it says that the Chief Justice of India would send a recommendation for the appointment of the Puin Judge. Now this term means Junior Judge as Chief Justice of that High Court or of another High Court in consultation with two senior most judges of the Supreme Court. So here the composition of the Collegium becomes CJI plus 
to senior most judge of the supreme court and regarding memorandum of procedure for appointment of other judges that is other permanent judges of the high court under article 217 Here also it highlights that the Chief Justice of India and the Collegium of two judges of the Supreme Court would take into account the views of Chief Justice of the High Court and those judges of High Court who have been consulted by the Chief Justice as well as views of those judges in the Supreme Court who are conversant with the affairs of the High Court. So here also the Collegium for appointment of permanent judges of High Court under Article two hundred and seventeen comprises of Chief Justice of India and Collegium of two senior most judges of the supreme court so these compositions have been minutely detailed in the memorandum of procedure with respect to appointment of permanent judges of high court with respect to memorandum of procedure for appointment of chief justice of high court and also in the mop regarding transfer of judge from one high court to another but here it highlights that the opinion of chief justice of india along with four senior most judges of the supreme court has to be taken in writing so here the collegium comprises of cji plus four senior most judges of supreme court now it's important to understand that these memorandum of procedure has been provided not only with respect to appointment and transfer of judges of high court but also that of supreme court and these mops now become important especially after the growing conflict between the executive and the judiciary with respect to judicial appointments so this mop with respect to transfer of judge from one high court to another further highlights that the proposal for transfer of the judge including the chief justice of the high court should be referred to the government of india along with the views of all those consulted in this regard so it says that after the recommendation of a transfer is received from the chief justice of india the union minister of law would submit the recommendation along with relevant papers to the prime minister who will then advise the president as to the transfer of the judge concerned now this is because judge of a high court is appointed under article 217 by the president of india and this is not a discretionary function of the indian president and he takes advice from his council of minister headed by the prime minister and this takes place even with respect to article 124 regarding appointment of judges of supreme court so there also as a process it is a prime minister who advises the president to appoint a judge of supreme court so here it highlights that after the president approves the transfer the secretary to the government of india in the department of justice will inform the chief justice of the high courts and chief ministers of the concerned states and will announce the transfer and issue necessary notification in the gazette of india so these are the elaborate process highlighted in the mop but nowhere in the mop timeline has been suggested and this is what has been highlighted by the law minister stating that no timeline as such has been specifically prescribed in the memorandum of procedure with respect to transfer of judge from one high court to another under article 222 of the indian constitution now i have added these memorandum of procedure in your pdf so what you can do you can go through this pdf to better understand the entire process now i will just highlight few important points with respect to appointment of chief justice of high court under article 217 the initiation of the proposal for appointment of chief justice of high court would be initiated by the chief justice of india however for the appointment of a permanent judge of high court other than the chief justice of the high court the proposal for appointment of a judge of the high court shall be initiated by the chief justice of the high court and here also the collegium comprises of cgi plus two supreme court judge and two high court judges So it says that the chief justice and judges of high courts are to be appointed by the president under article 217 clause 1 of the Indian constitution. So it says that when a permanent vacancy is expected to arise in any year in the office of a judge the chief justice will as early as possible but at least 6 months before the date of occurrence of the vacancy must communicate to the chief minister of the state his views as to the persons to be selected for appointment. So the chief justice of the high court must express to the chief minister his views regarding the names which he intends to suggest for appointment before forwarding his recommendation the chief justice must consult two of his senior most colleagues on the bench regarding the suitability of the names proposed so in this the chief justice of the high court must consult two other judges of the high court while recommending name to the chief minister so it says that all consultation must be in writing and these opinions must be sent to the chief minister along with their written recommendations 
सो द प्रपोजल फॉर अपॉइंटमेंट ऑफ अ जज ऑफ अ हाई कोर्ट शैल बी इनिशिएटेड बाय द चीफ जस्टिस ऑफ द हाई कोर्ट हाउ एवर इफ द चीफ जस्टिस डिजायर्स टू रिकमेंड द नेम ऑफ एनी अदर पर्सन ही शुड फॉरवर्ड द सेम टू द चीफ जस्टिस फॉर हिज कंसिडरेशन Now, since governor is bound by the advice of the chief minister heading the council of ministers, a copy of chief justice's proposal with full set of papers should simultaneously be also be sent to the governor to avoid any kind of delay. So, basically, the chief justice of high court sends the files or sends the names for recommendation not only to the chief minister but also to the governor. And similar copy comprising set of names is also sent to the chief justice of India. and also to the union law minister to expedite the process so based on the advice of the chief minister the governor forwards the recommendations of the names along with entire set of papers to the union law minister and then the union law minister considers the recommendations in light of such other reports as may be available to the government in respect of names under consideration now these reports can be related to ib reports or other reports which the government undertakes it then says that a complete material would then be forwarded to the chief justice of india for his advice that is set of names to be appointed as judge of the high courts chief justice of india would in consultation with the two senior most judge of the supreme court form his opinion to a person to be recommended for appointment to the high court now cgi and the collegium of two judges of supreme court would take into account views of the chief justice of high court and those judges of the high court who have been consulted by the chief justice So here the chief justice of high court has also consulted two other judges of high court as has been highlighted here which states that the chief justice of the high court must consult two of his senior most colleagues on the bench thus it mentions that the chief justice of india and the collegium of two judges of the supreme court would take into account the views of chief justice of the high court and those judges of the high court who have been consulted by the chief justice as well now these recommendations will then be sent to the prime minister who will then advise the president to appoint the judge of high court so basically these are some of the elaborate process which has been provided under the memorandum of procedure with respect to appointment of permanent judges of high court under article 217 now to know more you can go through the pdf as i have provided entire details with respect to the memorandum of procedure with respect to high courts Now let's take up this news appearing on page number ten, and this news is with respect to the discovery of lithium deposits in Jammu and Kashmir. So the news says that this discovery will help to cut down import needs with respect to lithium. So it says that the find will serve as a major boost to manufacture of rechargeable batteries for smartphones, laptops, and electric cars in the country. Now other news highlights that lithium reserves found in Jammu and Kashmir. according to mine secretary and currently india is import dependent for many minerals like lithium nickel and cobalt so obviously discovery of such a large deposit will help to reduce india's import substitution now the famous industrialist anand mahindra heralds india's electrifying future basically referring to electric cars after discovery of lithium deposits as these electric cars use lithium ion batteries Now please note that the Hindu newspaper has mentioned about discovery of 5.9 tons rather it is 5.9 million tons so it says that the union government said that 5.9 million tons of lithium reserves were found for the first time in Jammu and Kashmir in Risai district so according to geological survey of india it says that there was a presence of bauxite in composite form and during its processing lithium was also discovered and these mineral blocks for lithium are likely to be auctioned after sanction from the central government now another important aspect highlighted in this news is that the mines ministry has said that to strengthen the critical mineral supply chain for emerging technologies the government was taking several measures to secure minerals including lithium from australia and argentina so after finding or discovery of such large deposits of lithium in india itself import dependency for lithium will reduce in subsequent years so it says that currently india is import dependent for many minerals like lithium nickel and cobalt now if we talk about the location of risai district in jammu and kashmir this is where it is located so here let us understand about some of the important highlights with respect to lithium now it highlights that lithium is a rare mineral that is highly reactive lightweight and can also store large amounts of energy in compact space making it the ideal material for use in batteries 
Now the demand for lithium has grown globally as countries race to reduce carbon emissions and switch to clean energy and it is here where the use of lithium becomes more important that is to reduce the carbon footprint and it says that energy storage will play a crucial role in future so futuristically speaking we can see development of auto industries particularly for the electric vehicles and also use of lithium in the electronics market regarding manufacturing of mobile phones laptops or other electronic devices now lithium belongs to alkali metal group lightest of the solid metals it is soft white and lustrous and it has the lowest density among any metal and another important aspect is that it has high specific heat and it is found in brine deposits and as salts in mineral springs now brine is particularly high concentrated water solution of common salt that is sodium chloride and natural brines occur underground in salt lakes or as sea water and are commercially important sources of common salt and also other salts such as chlorides sulfates of magnesium and also potassium now according to the united states geological survey there are around 80 million tons of identified reserves globally as of 2019 and salar the uni salt flat in bolivia is world's single largest lithium resource now regarding the use and application of lithium it is used as a scavenger to remove impurities in the refining of metals such as iron nickel copper and zinc and also their alloys used as an initiator of polymerization in the production of synthetic rubber it is also extensively used in production of other organic chemicals especially pharmaceuticals lightweight lithium magnesium alloys and tough lithium aluminum alloys harder than aluminum have structural applications in aerospace and other industries and most extensive use of lithium is in rechargeable batteries namely cell phones laptops and e mobility now here you must note that lithium ion batteries are rechargeable while only lithium batteries are for single use so please remember this distinction or this difference Now talking about benefits of the discovery for India obviously it will help to reduce import dependency so it will reduce our imports in future so it says that as of now India is importing all of its lithium requirements that is almost 95% of the lithium requirements for the country comes from Hong Kong China Indonesia Singapore and Korea so presence of lithium deposits will reduce this import dependency or it will reduce import of lithium and overall it will help to save foreign exchange so it says that in the near future imports will further fall saving more foreign exchange for the government now the discovery of lithium deposit will further boost employment in the region as lithium can be said to be a sunrise sector now sunrise sector or a sunrise industry is one which is relatively new it is growing fast and is expected to become important in the future such as space sector food processing green hydrogen etc So it says that production of lithium would develop the battery industry in India as a sunrise sector which will further lead to more job creation. Now presence of lithium deposits will help to export lithium from India and with this development of battery industry India could enter the global supply chain of lithium ion batteries. Further presence of lithium deposits will help India to gain access to electronics market so it says that it would help India in gaining faster momentum in the electronics and digital services market globally and overall it will reduce production cost of battery industry and make it more competitive and talking particularly with respect to the automobile sector use of more electric vehicles will also be beneficial for the environment so why is india lagging behind in lithium so far obviously because of lack of availability of lithium as prior to this discovery india was mostly dependent on imports So it says that natural availability of lithium in India is the least almost insignificant prior to this discovery research and exploration in lithium is at nascent stage India has very limited participation in the exploration of lithium most of the current exploration of lithium is conducted as per the geological survey of India until 2021 that is a rolling out of production linked incentive scheme of the government there was no dedicated policy for lithium battery development in India So with the discovery of this large deposits of lithium the government should come up with a proper road map to use the lithium deposits for various industrial applications so as a way forward there is a need to create additional demand in the automobile sector especially through electric vehicles opening the exploration and mining for private sector under regulatory framework that is under regulation of the government and 
ensuring ease of exports of lithium ion batteries which are rechargeable so this can be said to be a way forward with respect to discovery of large deposits of lithium in jammu and kashmir and this topic becomes important mainly from the perspective of gs paper 3 under science and technology so with this we come to an end to today's discussion thank you for watching dns